ready to uh, begin our second panel. And um, I, the premise of this panel, of course, is that people have not been taking all this Iranian stuff lying down. Um, they've been trying to think about how uh, to best <coughs> protect their own interests, advance their own interests. Um, and several of them have thought that um, the best way to proceed is to um, acquire their own small nuclear arsenal. Uh, we've asked our panelists uh, to imagine once again um, that uh, this is the world, uh, this world has come to pass. The region is multi-nuclear. We're not specifying as yet who has and who has not um, <clears throat> acquired a weapon or a nuclear arsenal. And in fact, that would be one question right off the bat for, for our panels. Who, who uh, will have pursued it? Who will have succeeded? Who will have perhaps I've uh, gotten a quasi-nuclear arsenal by in uh, some form of alliance with other parties. Um, and how this will, um, how this event, this possibility will, will play out. Um, I think um, we might start with uh, our uh, French colleague, uh, Bruno Tertrace, and I have to uh, also introduce the rest of our panelists, which I have neglected to do. So let me um, uh, finish that uh, task. Um, I want to uh, especially thank Bruno because he has a meeting in Paris yesterday and a meeting in Paris tomorrow. That, that I'm organizing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I hope you do a better job than I have of organizing my notes. But uh, uh, Bruno is a senior research fellow with the Foundation for Strategic Research in Paris. Uh, he has been special assistant to di the director of strategic affairs of the French Ministry of Defense. Uh, also has spent some time as a fellow of the RAND Corporation. He has a master uh, in public law from the University of Paris and a doctorate from the Institute of Political Science, also in Paris. Um, unless he, uh, well, uh, he has most recently served as an advisor to the campaign of the new French president, Francois Hollande. Um, Lee Smith um, is a senior editor uh, at the Weekly Standard. Uh, he's written for Slate, uh, New York Times, Boston Globe, and too many other publications for me to list, uh, including uh, several publications in the Middle East. Uh, he, he is also the author, uh, not so long ago, of a book called The Strong Horse, Power, Politics, and the Clash of Arab Civilizations. Um, finally, um, Chris Ford um, is a colleague of ours at the Hudson Institute, where he's a senior fellow. Um, he served previously as, as the U.S. Special Representative for Nuclear Nonproliferation, uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Nonproliferation, Disarmament Verification, and Compliance, covers a lot of territory, uh, was General Counsel to the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, he's the author of The Mind of Empire, uh, China's history and modern uh, foreign relations. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning and for addressing this. I'm just, I think we'll start with Bruno if that's okay. Sure. Okay, I'm going to play the game you asked me to play. This is the year 2022. Uh, it's been a slow motion process, but Saudi Arabia went there first. <coughs> Egypt is getting closed and others are unclear. Some of them are hedging, perhaps. But the broad picture is that it's a nuclear jungle. It's not a well-tendered French garden. It's not a Cold War-like situation. <coughs> they have several nuclear diets, but you don't have a block-to-block -block confrontation. Of course, the most interesting case was Saudi Arabia, 
when Riyadh and Islamabad considered their options for facing a nuclear armed Iran, they had several options. They ended up deciding that deploying nuclear missiles in Saudi Arabia was a win-win proposition because Pakistans then could get money, ethanol gratitude, and most importantly, an additional element of survivability uh, of their own forces. Egypt was a different case. Uh, four factors led Egypt to seriously consider getting the bomb. First of all, Iran has shown the bomb. You remember the way the Iranians, when they first produced uh, um, exafluoride uranium, they just showed, literally showed them during sort of a ballet. You know, it was a very <laughs> elaborate show. So you can <coughs> bet that if they have the bomb, they're going to show it. Maybe you have another more elaborate ballet about it. Uh, for the Egyptians, I Iran getting in b the bomb was a blow to 40 years of Egyptian diplomacy geared towards the establishment of a nuclear-free uh, Middle East. And since it has also led Israel to become much more open about its own nuclear capability, uh, it, uh, in uh, it was an, uh, an incentive for the Muslim Brotherhood to look for their nuclear options, especially since they were themselves looking for uh, an increased domestic legitimacy. <laughs> um, an interesting question for the risks of further <coughs> proliferation. Two interesting questions. What if Iran, what if a nuclear armed Iran says, well, we have the bomb, but we're ready to give it up if Israel does? An interesting question for debate. Then there's the, my all-time favorite, uh, including because it's a country which is very close to my own, which is Algeria. Now, Algeria never wanted to be the first uh, Arab nuclear-capable state, but would certainly hate to be the third. <laughs> uh, among the questions that the organizers put to us, that would the new nuclear arms states in the Middle East get into a, quote, use it or lose it posture? Um, I don't think that, ne neither do I believe that the risks of deliberate state transfer of nuclear weapons uh, to outside parties would be a, a uh, serious risk. I mean, these, the, the use it or lose it dilemma was always a more academic question than a real world question. And most states, and I would anticipate that newly um, armed, newly nuclear armed Middle East countries would uh, not be an exception, consider nuclear weapons as their crown jewels, so to say. So the circumstances under which they would deliberately transfer nuclear weapons, I'm not talking about materials or technology, but weapons, uh, seems to me, would seem to, to be uh, extraordinarily uh, hypothetical. I anticipate that the nuclear taboo or tradition on non-use would still hold in a polynuclear uh, Middle East. But another interesting question for debate. What if at some point in 10 years from now the nuclear taboo has been broken already? What if somewhere, for instance in Asia, uh, a nuclear weapon has exploded in anger? What would it mean for the possibilities of, of Middle East nations using their nuclear weapons? Other questions, what happens to the big non-nuclear countries, such as Iraq or Syria? Would they bandwagon? Would, they, <coughs> would, be, would the logic of zones of influence um, uh, uh, prevail? Uh, another interesting uh, question. Um, consequences for Iran. How does Iran react to the fact that two, maybe three countries are uh, now having nuclear weapons? Well, Iran would say, I guess, we're Persia. We're nuclear. But now we have to have the biggest, most sophisticated, and the most secure arsenal in the region. We're not Arabs. We're not Turks. We're not Pakistanis. We have to have the best nuclear arsenal. So this puts, I would say, pressure on Iran itself to develop and increase its arsenal. Now, uh, finally, and I will leave it to... Uh, others to discuss that, but I wonder whether Iran uh, would be tempted to uh, get uh, closer relations with India, which is probably the country of the region to which it can measure itself, including in terms of uh, nuclear behavior. Uh, the non-proliferation treaty died in 2015 when the <laughs> New York conference ended up in a, a shouting match between the, and the uh, non-aligned movement, which was so united against Israel, became a completely uh, destroyed, but its unity became completely destroyed. Um, and finally, I would say that one of the most interesting insights that we should get from this kind of uh, um, future world thinking is that by definition in a world like this one, the United States and the Western countries in general have suffered huge blows to their credibility. Not only do they have failed to prevent Iran from becoming nuclear, 
but they also, by definition, in this scenario, failed to prevent further proliferation. And not only did they fail to prevent further proliferation, but they failed to prevent further proliferation among countries which were their friends, friends and allies. In Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey are uh, their friends and allies. So this is not rogue states proliferation. This is like back to the 60s or 70s proliferation when the goal, the first and foremost goal of uh, getting a non-proliferation treaty was preventing your own friends to have a nuclear weapon. But they, we have failed. So containment is no longer an option. Extended deterrence is no longer an option. Military action is no longer an option. What's left? <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Bruno. I, I'm not I'll, sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, as, since you mentioned that the NPT is gone, uh, what is the IAEA also? Um, no, the I, no, the IAEA has a much broader mandate than, than just um, ensuring that uh, countries which have signed an agreement with it do not develop nuclear weapons. But no, I, I don't see any reason why the IAEA itself uh, would not exist. Now, whether... It's, uh, it has an important role in terms of preventing further proliferation. I don't know, uh, but, um, but since you've uh, allowed me another, uh, another shot, I would say that among the things, because I have another list, I could go on, you know, but Japan has noticed. Japan has noticed that even though it had signed up uh, the NPT uh, for a world of uh, five nuclear weapons, then now it's a world of uh, 12, uh, to, uh, 12 to 15 uh, nuclear weapon states. And obviously, if the NPT has died, by definition, in this scenario, I think Japan is seriously considering its own option. Lee? Thanks. This is on. Um, thanks very much, Halel, and thank you, Scooter, and thanks uh, for including me at this very interesting uh, morning here at Hudson. Uh, it strikes me that there is a way of looking at the two, another way of looking at the two panels, uh, what happens after Iran gets the bomb, and what does a... Uh, multi-nuclear Middle East look like. And another way to look at that is in terms of U.S. interest, in which case the first would be U.S. hegemony in the Persian Gulf. Does that equation change after Iran gets the bomb? And the second is uh, prolifer pr proliferation of WMD in the, in the Middle East. And these are two vital U.S. interests. I think it's a very interesting way to look at it because this particular administration has tended to, uh, I don't want to dwell too much in the present and I'm eager to get to the future in a second, I just want to say that this administration has <coughs> focused too much on what it means for Israel. Uh, most of the rhetoric has been centered on uh, the president is not bluffing, the president has Israel's back, all options are on the table. It's not about Israel. The United States has very, very significant interests in the Persian Gulf. So the way that I'd like to look at it, and I'm going to go very quickly, is to look at it under two different scenarios. And the first is, is that uh, the first is, is that there is proliferation in the Middle East, and the U.S. is still still exercises hegemony in the Persian Gulf. The other way to look at it is the U.S. is no longer exercising hegemony in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and again, I want to say, I think if you look at some of the different things that have happened with this administration, I think it might be leading that way. If you look at, um, well, first of all, let's compare it to the Carter Doctrine, which was articulated after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, that any, uh, any threats on the Persian Gulf from outside forces would uh, would require would require U.S. might require U.S. military force, and the so-called Reagan corollary to the Carter Doctrine was that this also applied to internal threats as well. And if you look at what happened over the next three administrations, up to the George W. Bush administration, George H. W. Bush, the Clinton administration, and the George W. Bush administration all did use military power to assert U.S. hegemony in the Persian Gulf. If you compare that to what has happened now with the Obama administration, where we've drawn down troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, well, let's just look at it for a second, how uh, perhaps the Iranians might see it. If we've withdrawn troops from Iraq and Afghanistan, if 
if we turned our back, again, how the Iranians perceive it, there are differences of opinion here, if we turned our back on Hosni Mubarak and angered the Saudis for doing so, our key Persian Gulf ally, uh, if when Bashar al-Assad faced the same difficulties, we chose, the United States chose inaction and actually bought time for Assad with, uh, by backing the Annan plan. And similarly, the United States bought time, the Obama administration bought time for the Iranian nuclear program with three different rounds of negotiations. If you're an Iranian, it might look, <laughs> what it might look like is that the Obama administration is essentially protecting Iran's security architecture, right? Between the Syrians and between the Iranian nuclear program. What is the Obama administration up to? Is it saying that is it saying that U.S. hegemony in the Persian Gulf is just not that big a deal? <laughs> That's certainly an argument that they could make. We haven't heard it yet. But again, I think, to come back to the main subject, I think that the idea of a multi-nuclear Middle East would assume that the United States no longer exercises hegemony in the region. Another way to put that is, why don't the Saudis already have a nuclear bomb? <laughs> I mean, if they are, uh, and, and I, I hope, well, I'm sure the ambassador can address this much more intelligently than I can and much more directly, but if the Saudis uh, were, played a very important role in the building of the Pakistani, in, in the Pakistani bomb, why don't the Saudis already have a nuclear bomb? And that is because they figured that the United States was exercising hegemony in the region. Um, so I agree with Bruno that the Saudis would be the first. If the Sa I mean, I think another way to look at it is the Saudis already have a bomb. Um, they, it's not in their possession yet, but I assume that once the... Once the nuclear ballet is once the second round of nuclear ballet is performed in Tehran, the Saudis will move very, very quickly toward a bomb. So let me just go through these two quick. Let me just go through these two quick things. Um, the first is if the United States is exercising is not exercising hegemony in the region. If the United States is looking on from afar, and if we've abandoned different, uh, if we've abandoned different bases throughout the Gulf, maybe keep a, uh, a token detachment here or there. There is actually a system of deterrence among the Arab actors. And if you look at the use of, if you look at their use of terrorists, and especially if you look at the use of Muslim Brotherhood units, you see an active system of deterrence. I'm thinking specifically of the Syrians and the Jordanians, that the Syrian, and, uh, the Syrian regime backed is back the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood for a long time in the same way that the Jordanians have backed the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, including giving residence to, uh, to Bayanuni and other leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the idea, is, the idea is obvious. The idea is if you're going to mess with us, with our Muslim Brotherhood, we will do the same to you. So there is an actual system of deterrence. And this breaks out all the time. We actually see the Arabs fighting. Um, in which case, what we need to look at is we need to look at the different rivalries in the region to see where problems might erupt. And uh, I can't recall who it was. It might have been the ambassador who mentioned it on the first panel who spoke about Egypt. But I see Egypt as being the central problem. Egypt is the central issue, if, uh, especially now, especially when the... Uh, role of the Muslim Brotherhood and the role of the military is unclear. And one thing I like to remind people of all the time, and this would apply to the nuclear program, the idea that the Egyptian military acts in terms of rational interest is preposterous. The idea that the Egyptian military knows that it can't win another war with Israel, it would never have another war with Israel, this makes no sense. The Egyptian military, against its will in some cases, has gone to war with Israel four different times. It would be, it would be uh, you can make the case that not once did the military or the leadership itself choose, the war, choose to make war on Israel in the way that it was made. So Israel is a big problem. I'm, I'm sorry, Egypt is a big problem. Uh, the other rivalries, the other typical rivalries that you would look at 
Uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, this has been a problem. Egypt and Iraq. Um, actually, I suspect the Egypt and Iraq rivalry will come about. Uh, this is a historical rivalry, Cairo and Baghdad. And then another rivalry I suspect we'll see, especially, uh, especially if Assad is overturned and Syria turns into a Sunni regime, but I think we'll see more rivalry between Cairo and Damascus. So these are different dynamics to look at. If the U.S. main stays in the Middle East, that system of deterrence will change, uh, largely because of terrorism. If we look at the way that the U.S. has looked at state support of terrorism, the Arabs understand what's happening when different Arab actors are backing terrorist outfits, why they do it and why it happens. The U.S. has been much more reluctant to call out different state actors on their support for terrorism, including, of course, uh, Pakistan regarding bin Laden, but it happens across the board. If we look right now with Syria, and the administration has <clears throat> noted the presence of al-Qaeda operating in Syria, uh, you'll recognize that it is ref that it's neglected to remark that it was the Syrian regime itself that cultivated that relationship with Sunni jihadis. So, in a sense, a multi-nuclear Middle East might be more dangerous with the United States still exercising, uh, or with the United States still involved in the region. Uh, and, and I think I'll leave it there right now. Chris? Thank you, um, and thanks to, to Hillel and Scooter and the gang for putting this together. It's a depressing topic, but since it's an important one, it's, uh, it's good that we get the chance to, to talk about it. What I thought I'd like to, to, to do in this is take the, the perspective of, well, let's assume that all this happens, and we do have a polynuclear Middle East. What would it be like? How would these dynamics actually work there? I mean, it's often suggested that, well, in the event that countries, it's sort of a cascade of proliferation happens, well, then deterrence will prevail. Well, it, it, I suppose it would until it stopped prevailing. Um, <laughs> and, and I guess the question is what dynamics would be in play and how, how can we evaluate the possibility of a polynuclear Middle East, which you might call a, a PNME, if you like uh, uh, acronyms. <laughs> uh, and I didn't spend that long in government, but, but acronyms come <laughs> scarily naturally. You should um, uh, copyright that acronym <laughs> for future use. I hope it doesn't get a lot of chances to get used, although it's possible that it will. Um, so what would it look like? What would it feel like? How would the dynamics work inside such a thing? And I think the easiest thing to say, and it's a very simple thing, um, is that a PNME um, would likely be more prone to conflict than today's Middle East, uh, and that the consequences of such conflict, were they to occur, would be shockingly, perhaps, high. Um, the basic problem is pretty commonsensical, and that is that the more players there are in any kind of a nuclear deterrent system relationship, uh, the more unstable it's likely to be. Now, you could express this in all kinds of fancy game theoretical and mathematical ways, but you don't need to. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> the more players there are in the nuclear game, the more dyadic relationships will exist. Uh, and the more relationships that exist, the more axes there will be, if you will, along which any individual player needs to make calculations of what deters someone else. And by the way, these things will not just be bilateral. These will have to be done simultaneously along many axes. Uh, the more relationships in this sense, the more chances there are or break down to occur for various reasons. Um, but I'm not just talking about accidents, because even without accidents, I think more players in such a game is clearly trouble, or at least worrisome and dangerous. Because, as I said, the more axes there are along which these kinds of calculations need to be made, the harder it will be to find a single approach from the perspective <laughs> of any particular player that will in fact suffice to keep the peace. After all, you can only really have one force posture at a time. Yet if you have five or six different players in the game, um, you'll clearly have to make some kind of a choice. You may perhaps pick the approach that is uh, you think is best tailored for the particular target that you worry about most and leave the others to, well, you know, hopefully that'll be okay. Or you decide to sort of satisfy us across a broader landscape of potential deterrent targets and you pick a kind of lowest common denominator force posture and approach to nuclear weaponry, which you know isn't going to work very well against any particular one of them, but you, ha you hope that in the aggregate will end up being to your advantage. Um, you know, the moral of this story is you know, don't expect any kind of sophisticated calibration here, even if you can do the very subjective calculation of what it is you think will in fact deter somebody else, which is not a uh, scientific uh, calculation, but really more of an art, or an, an instinctive assumption. Um, deterrence, of course, is a very subjective sort of thing. Um, and I think you should expect that polynuclearity, if that's a word, uh, which it isn't, uh, will create incentives for any individual player to aim high um, in building their force posture. 
uh, in order to hedge against the possibility of having any, an insufficient deterrent on any particular accident. Oh, but wait, there's more. Um, if anything, I think this may understate the problem, because nuclear planners in such a world would not be uh, able to worry merely about bilateral deterrent relationships. They'd also have to be concerned to some degree, greater or lesser, depending upon the circumstances and who they were, with what Bismarck is reported once to have called le, le cauchemar des coalitions, the nightmare of coalitions. That is, the possibility of any particular player having to face opportunistic nuclear alliances at any one particular point in time. Um, so these are enormous complications that, frankly, we didn't have to worry about quite so much during the Cold War. We had the luxury of uh, staring at one particular um, uh, adversary in a context in which the, the, possessor, the weapons possessions of other powers were essentially statistical noise, uh, and there was really a very clear bilateral game. In a genuinely polynuclear environment, these are calculations that become mind-bogglingly complex and dangerously unpredictable. But there's another source of unpredictability as well, of course, because as we speculate about how states would behave in such a context, we can't presume that all weapon holders in this environment will think about or handle uh, nuclear weaponry in the same way that we do. We've got to be careful to avoid mirror imaging here. Um, and we can't necessarily assume that they, in fact, would be able to follow the precedents that we understand with respect to how nuclear weapons are to be, to be handled, uh, even if they did wish to do so, which itself is not certain. Different players would likely adopt somewhat different nuclear answers to the challenges that they face, the, the tensions that are inherent in, in trying to manage um, approaches to, to strategic nuclear policy. Um, they'd try to adopt these different answers at the same time, um, and particularly to the extent that disparities exist from one country to the next and the degree to which they can expect to have real command and control integrity, the degree to which they feel they can have uh, delivery system survivability in the field, or you know that sort of thing. All these variables will, will, will produce different nuclear answers to the same set of, of or similar sets of, of tensions and conflict. Um, but as each player adopts a different answer, of course, um, these are each represent different compromises between the issues involved. And there's a danger, of course, that as the number of players increase, this you know, the balance between them in this context, between these sort of apples and oranges and watermelons and kiwi fruit, will end up being no meaningful balance at all, uh, especially if the system happens to be stressed in some fashion by uh, crisis uh, within or between uh, one or more of the participants. And by the way, I, uh, this doesn't even begin to scratch the issue. I'm looking at this from a sort of a how can or could deterrence or would deterrence keep the peace in a sense um, in a general war context, in a nuclear use context. Uh, I'm not, this, this, this analysis doesn't even begin to touch the issue of what happens if one or more players seek to use nuclear weapons to change the status quo. This is essentially a sort of a deterrence-focused analysis. And, and even in that context, it's problematic. And uh, you know, the, the additional wild card is what happens if someone, such as Iran or perhaps others, seek to use these tools to, to change the status quo. Um, traditional deterrent calculations don't have a lot to say about uh, that sort of thing. And indeed, one could argue, has, has been, there's a fair amount of academic work on this, and we've heard it talked about earlier today as well, uh, in certain circumstances, the possession of a nuclear umbrella, as it were, can in fact be a, a, an enabling uh, function or lower-level uh, proxy violence or uh, support of non-state actors or lower-level aggression um, that it, you know, could be thought to take place under the protective cover of, well, he can't retaliate against me with general war because I have nuclear weapons, therefore that frees me up as long as I don't get too extravagant in my, in my aggression. So these are additional wild cards. Um, but I mentioned that, that sort of basic sort of game-theoretical deterrent calculations are likely to be very problematic in this kind of a game, especially if the system were stressed by a conflict within or between participating players. Um, and that's another problem, of course, because we're talking not about an abstract game theoretical system here. We're talking about the Middle East. Um, you know, overlay all of this sort of polynuclear instability on top of the basic political and institutional societal instability that this, this region is known for on the best of days. And I think you have a, uh, a very combustible mix indeed. Now, I want to let the discussion get going, but let me highlight one further issue before I conclude. It is, I think, commonly assumed um, that the acquisition of nuclear weapons will have the effect to some degree of immunizing state, a state or states within the region from the prospect of direct attack, either within the region or, or from outside. Um, and in, in many cases, that perhaps is true, but I wanted to make the point here that it is not a given that that will remain true over the lifetime of this system. And that if local conditions are particularly volatile and, and particularly internal stability questions arise, it is not that hard to imagine scenarios in which the presence of nuclear weapons may make outside intervention 
perhaps more likely rather than less. Let me give you a couple of hypotheticals. Imagine if we had not succeeded in ridding Libya, working with the Libyans, frankly, to rid Libya of its WMD in 2003 and 2004. Uh, and that Gaddafi had gone on to develop a handful of weapons before his country disintegrated into civil war last year. Um, would these weapons have protected Libya against outside intervention? Um, or would they at some point, as things came to disintegrate, have made intervention from the outside all the more desperately necessary in order to prevent the use of such things? Mm -hmm. Or to prevent them from going walkabout into the terrorist <clears throat> shadowy hinterlands of the Sahel? Um, or imagine a, uh, a nuclear-armed Saudi Arabia teetering on the brink of collapse uh, due to some kind of internal upheaval at the hands, perhaps, of uh, you know, various, you know, the flavor du jour of Sunni fanatic. Um, would that protect Saudi Arabia, or would it, in fact, actually, under you know, as things became sufficiently bad, incite some kind of preemptive, run the risks of inciting some kind of preemptive and prophylactic attack from the outside, either regionally or extra-regionally, in order to destroy Saudi Arabia's nuclear assets before those bunkers were overrun, for instance. Um, and we should also not forget that regimes on the point of regime collapse don't necessarily approach deterrence cost-benefit calculations in the same way as they would in more times of uh, stability. So these are all very troubling variables, and I certainly, you know, we're not prophets, none of us can tell you exactly how a PNME would work. But I think it's safe enough to say that it would be a potentially very, very dangerous and troublesome and, and, and unpredictable environment indeed, more than we perhaps often assume um, uh, coming out of our legacy of, of bipolar deterrence that did seem to work during the Cold War. Um, and since it seems likely that it would be a terribly worrisome place, to the extent that our willingness to accept risks and bear burdens today uh, must necessarily be, or at least should be, um, conditioned by our assessment of the likelihood and the magnitude of, of dangers down the road, um, being aware of just how big and ugly those potential things down the road might be, inescapably should be conditioning policy choices that we make in the present day. So the stakes, I think, are enormously high, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say and talk about as we address this threat. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> before I um, go on to Hussein, I, w I just wanted to make sure I understood um, your one of your your next to last point, I think, which was that the issue of what one might call loose nukes uh, actually presents you with the concern: if you don't intervene on the front end, you may have to intervene on the back end. Uh, as be, it, you could intervene. The way you put it presupposed basically powers outside the region which would have a concern with the nuclear weapons within it and that uh, there would be two ways to approach this. You might want to prevent regimes from acquiring them in the first place, but that carries certain costs. Uh, what's not been calculated in is the cost that... Um, might arise from the collapse of those regimes once they had nuclear weapons. Is that? I, I think so. I mean, I think there may be a there may be a window. Um, you know, at the in the early stages, you know, there's sort of a curve. <laughs> at the early stages, there are perhaps windows for intervention from outside powers wishing, or or regional powers. Let's not put that aside. We're talking about a polynuclear situation here, um, and we're not <coughs> talking only about conventional military tools. Uh, but there there may be windows for intervention early on to prevent the situation of further proliferation from materialize. Um, a stable regime with a you know, creditable arsenal may buy itself some time uh, and, and protection from the outside. But if, I mean, the hypothetical is if that regime gets to the point of a sufficiently uh, terrible degree of disintegration, raising the possibility of, of lack of institutional integrity and you know, who controls these things, who might use them, under what circumstances, you know, are, they, are you confident that this would be kept from insane uses? Um, or alternatively, could these things just disappear someplace, and then what would happen then? Then outside policy, I mean outside their borders, not necessarily outside the region, um, would have a very different set of calculations. What is the least worst approach, if you will, right. uh, under those circumstances? And the answer may not be the same. This, this is what's happening in Syria right now with the chemical, uh, the chemical warhead stockpile, right? The people are, the Jordanians are concerned. I gather the Israelis are as well, and, and we are. That's interesting. I hadn't thought that that's a... Uh, yeah. Yes, no, I think it is an analogous case, and it's, uh, and in some respects, the, uh, the problem we now face in Syria on, with respect to that issue, obviously, is 
a kind of precedent for the kind of thing that's Christmas. My understanding is that the, there's a sort of a popular strain of opinion in the Pakistani media that is convinced that if things go really bad, you'll see U.S. special forces running around all over Pakistan trying to secure those weapons. I don't know if that's actually realistically possible or feasible or remotely a credible conspiracy theory, but you could imagine circumstances in different countries with different geographies and different capabilities and different situations where maybe that's not so crazy. And by the way, maybe it's actually a good idea rather than face the potential consequences of it not occurring. So these are, you know, all, all I mean to do is toss more uncertainty and potential wrinkles out there and to sort of problematize, this is a very jargony phrase, to problematize our familiarity with the idea that weapons buy immunity for a regime ain't necessarily so. Hussein. Well, I mean, first of all, I just want to make a quick comment on something that Chris brought us. So let's try and visualize the past. If Gaddafi had actually acquired nuclear weapons, what would have happened when the revolt began in Benghazi? Uh, would he have used dukes uh, on Benghazi? Mm. I mean, these are things that sometimes people don't think because we all uh, make very limited boxes in which we think. So as we are discussing all of this today about, I wonder if anybody had actually done some of this about, you know, when India goes nuclear, how will you stop Pakistan from doing it? Why? Would, why should Pakistan restrain itself? The effort should have been made to stop India to be able to stop Pakistan. Um, India went nuclear only after China went nuclear. So my point is Iran may be, may be the moment when people wake up to the concept of maybe no one should have nuclear weapons because here's what I see happening. So Iran gets its nukes, announces, and then next morning we have a call from Saudi Arabia to Pakistan. And uh, not only from Saudi Arabia, we get calls from Kuwait. Um, um, I feel terrible that I won't be in the government of Pakistan at that moment because that would be the moment to be the most important people in the world at that <laughs> moment. You know, I, I miss out that opportunity sitting here at Hudson or, or at Boston University. Instead. In other words, otherwise, it's going to be a seller's market. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, otherwise I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be entertaining some of these phone calls, you know, the UAE at times. Uh, what happens to those who say, you know what, these Pakistanis, why should we ask them? Let's look for a nuclear umbrella from India. After all, Kuwait and India, you know, go a long, a way, uh, a long way back. Let's try and do that. And everybody's forgotten that Kim Jong-il had developed some kind of nuclear capability too, and North Korea needs some resources and money too. So what if somebody says, you know what, this is just too complicated. We have to look out for ourselves. Why does it have to be just, you know, a nuclear umbrella provided either by the United States, which by the way, some of them are going to do. I mean, Qatar is going to say, you know what, we've had, we've, we've, we've invested a lot of money in being your friend. We've sold you oil. We've followed everything you wanted us to do in the region. Uh, we are very small, uh, but the United States should be our protector. Uh, so, so, so you have a rush for finding new nuclear protectors amongst the Arab countries. I think that's something that shouldn't be forgotten. Um, and you don't know who, what some of those players might actually do. I mean, I can predict Pakistan. Pakistan is, with all its difficulties, etc., etc., we do have a state structure, and therefore decision make, there is some process of decision-making. But just the mention of Libya made me think, you know, what would have been the decision-making in, 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 in Libya? Or what would be the decision-making in, 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 in post-Sultan and post-Naif Saudi Arabia where we are not... The succession is not as assured as it used to be. Uh, so which faction will control the nuclear program when it does get it? Um, Algeria was brought in by Bruno, and I thought about it. And I thought, you know what? Maybe people don't look at the nuclear issue in the world as they ought to. It kind of something happens, and then everybody says, Iran, what? And so we are having this session. So let's just stretch it stretch it further and further. Turkey. Turkey's stated position is we don't want nuclear weapons in our region. We don't like them. Uh, nobody should have them. They keep saying that. But now somebody has them. So what does Turkey do? After all, Turkey, uh, especially under the AK party, does have sort of new Ottoman ambitions. They do look upon the former Ottoman Empire as their natural sphere of influence. Uh, the term sphere of influence was mentioned earlier this morning by uh, Samantha, uh, I think. Uh, Yes, it, 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 it's going to be a rush for, new, for, for uh, spheres of influence. 
Um, Iran and India uh, uh, have a very good relationship. How does Pakistan feel about that? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, Pakistan will have to go, uh, you know, Pakistan does have all the obligations and responsibilities of dealing with Saudi Arabia, etc. But uh, Pakistan's traditional fear, fear that has made Pakistan get so embroiled in Afghanistan has always been uh, being caught in a pincer movement with India to its east and Afghanistan to its west in a conventional setting. Now Pakistan could be caught in a nuclear pincer on both sides, with Iran having nuclear weapons, India having nuclear weapons, both countries thinking of the Pakistanis as upstart because talk to any Indian and there are a few in the crowd, mm -hmm. and they will talk to you about the great Indian civilization, and so will the Persians. Every Iranian I've ever spoken to, uh, sort of, you know, uh, in, 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 in including the ones who haven't yet discovered the use of deodorant while studying in, 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 in madrasas, they still talk about the ancient in Iranian civilization the, and, and, and Islamic revolution and the Islamic Republic being the inheritor of the great Persian empire. So you have these two civilizational powers, how do they threaten my poor little country that is just 65 years old, you know, and doesn't have a claim, has, thinks of itself as the rebirth of the Indo-Persian elements of the evolution of humanity. Um, you have new ideological paradigms with Iran going nuclear for different countries, number one. Number two, you have a mad rush, the jungle, you know, several countries looking for options. And the concept of deterrence going down the tube for the simple reason that this is not about deterrence anymore. Who's deterring whom? It's, and I don't know how many people remember, but the concept of deterrence gave rise to the concept of reassurance because it used to be said that deterrence and reassurance are mutually uh, tied concepts. So, so that's what was the beginning of the Soviet-American uh, uh, engagement. Uh, in the post-nuclear phase, you know, uh, deterrence, but also you have to have some arrangements of reassurance. Pakistan and India have tried a little bit, but at a very basic level. Um, how many of these will be able, countries will be able to create sufficient reassurance? Will any amount of reassurance be enough for Israel? Uh, with uh, a Muslim Brotherhood-led Egypt and a clerically-led Iran and the great kingdom of Saudi Arabia, all having some form of nuclear uh, devices uh, available to be deployed. Um, so will we now need and some of the younger people in the audience who are just coming out, interning in the hope of building a career, here's your career, start thinking about post-nuclear deterrence nukes, you know, what happens to, to, to nuclear theory when deterrence is not low, is not the only concept available, when actually some actors may actually think about deploying, using uh, nuclear weapons, and also nuclear weapons as prestige, and nuclear weapons as, 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 as bargaining tokens. Uh, sort of, you know, I have the nukes, so therefore talk to me and negotiate with me, which is what some people think about North Korea. But then, with, with this whole region, uh, is it just regional or are the consequences global? Does the availability of a market in the Middle East and the l relative liquidity that comes from it makes North Korea enhance the quality of its nuclear program and therefore force South Korea and Japan do things? As it is, I was just thinking of the map. You know, when I, when I teach at Boston University, one of the things I tell American young people is usually to learn to visualize the map because most Americans kind of can't even visualize sort of, you know, what's Georgia next to, you know, the state of Georgia down south, not, not, not the country Georgia, you know. They, in other words, they, a trick they, question. Yeah. yeah, it's always a trick question. They can't, they, can't, they can't visualize who's next to whom, you know. So uh, The answer is uh, all of the above. Yeah. But 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 the but but think about it. As it is a nuclear <coughs> arc already evolved, Pakistan adjacent to India, adjacent to China, adjacent to North Korea. So there's like at least four sort of countries that are uh, uh, that abut each other. All the nuclear theory development that took place in this country was in a period when there was the Soviet Union and the United States who were pretty far away. You had reaction time. You had response time, etc., etc. I mean, I've 
studied that at college. I've kind of forgotten some of it, thank God. Uh, didn't need it. But you know this uh, sort of second strike, third strike, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, uh, preemption. All those theories worked when there was some distance between you. There was some ability to kind of uh, respond. Um, the, the 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 bringing down of nuclear weapons, sort of you know the umbrella or, or the shield, the, the 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 missile shield and stuff like that could be conceptualized. Here, there's very little room for for, for maneuver and 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 for 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 movement. Iran is sitting in the center. Um, the distance between Iran and the Gulf countries uh, is 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 very small. And so then, what? And and then and then the role of the United States as the hegemon and and the and the sort of the preeminent power in the Gulf region. Um, all those questions, all of a sudden, open up. And this is not a can of worms; it's a can of nukes, and it opens up. Thanks very much. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure Scooter has a couple of questions to ask. Um, I'll I'll throw a couple out. I mean. Um, <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, this was a, a great opening. A um, couple of things occurred to me. Uh, first, um, Lee's remark about the, um, let's say we consider a situation in which several countries have nuclear weapons in the Middle East. Um, that doesn't end the competition between them. Uh, they still have both grievances and means to pursue them. Uh, but the grievances would st the, the pursuit of them would start out at a lower level. Basically, the use of uh, mu <laughs> mutually assured terrorism. Um, so <clears throat> I guess one question would be, I mean, in a way that would be a, a tolerable situation so long as it stays at that level, um, so long as the <clears throat> carrying on of these grievances by other means does not escalate to the um, to the nuclear level. Uh, might not be pretty, but it's not um, it's not you know an ultimate kind of destructive war. Uh, one question is how likely it would be that um, the, the if if we can use this word the statesmen in the region would be able to manage this and know what the limits are. Um, <coughs> And then the question is what, building on that, is what really are, what are likely to be, uh, to supply some actual substance or content to the, the mathematical possibilities, what are likely to be the real fault lines which would be come into play here? And um, I was struck uh, uh, that until Hussein's remarks, no one had brought up Turkey. Um, is um, it's assumed that Saudi Arabia is in play, that Iraq, Egypt, and so forth. Um, but if there is a major fault line developing between Sunnis and Shiites, and if, for example, as we heard in the first panel, there's a kind of uh, almost uh, ideological imperative for Iran to sort of represent itself as uh, making progress in um, the various things of which it could be the leader of the Shiite world, the Muslim world, the anti-Western world. Um, uh, does, you know, sort of Turkey just sort of say, okay, go ahead, you're, <clears throat> you're in charge now, or does it uh, try to uh, not only seek weapons, but seek to uh, uh, promote its ambitions uh, through that, and whether uh, in that process, join various parties like the Egyptians, like the Saudis, um, who would have, um, as I think Chris was talking about, uh, the possibility of forming up all kinds of alliances. Yeah. Um, that, those are my questions. I'm sure Chris, uh, Scooter has some other. Who do you want to start with? Those. Yeah. <clears throat> can, can I sure. take a, a shot at the Turkey one? Uh, <coughs> there is sometimes a form of intellectual laziness from us analysts to put uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey in the same basket of the proliferation cascade problem. Uh, as others have said today, it's a more 
complex subtle uh, dynamics that would develop and I deliberately put Saudi Arabia first, Egypt second, and Turkey third. Uh, let's not forget that um, Turkey not only benefits from an Article 5 guarantee, but it uh, is at this point in time the only NATO country which has both uh, nuclear weapons and elements of a missile defense system on its soil. Therefore, uh, two concrete materialization of, uh, of this nuclear guarantee. As long as this system exists, I really don't see Turkey going further than doing a little hedging by having, for instance, an enrichment capability on its on its soil, which is something that is it is actually thinking about. So, uh, of course, as most Turks, um, uh, I was about to say smart Turks, but there are, uh, I know a lot of smart Turkish friends, but then this is something which is directly related with, I had this conversation with an, uh, a colleague of Iranian origin one day, with, and someone who's not part of the regime, he said, well, this smart Turk told me, he said, smart Turk? There's no such thing as a smart Turk. <laughs> this gives you an idea of uh, the way some Iranians see, uh, see, see the Turks, but they, can, they would feel extremely uncomfortable, and I'm not entirely certain that just having... You mean the Turks? Would feel yes, the Turks. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of them know, know it already, but it's not going to be the first to go nuclear. Can I take advantage of the, the fact that you gave me the floor to answer some of the other questions? Sure. Uh, the question that was raised by Hassan about uh, Libya is an interesting one. Let me give you my personal answer. Uh, I don't think that France and the UK would necessarily have been deterred by the fact that Libya would have a, a nuclear military capability. <coughs> After all, this is what our own nukes are made for, to be able to counter the blackmail of other countries if, if we feel it's in our interest to do something. Uh, if we are self-deterred by the existence of a small nuclear capability in a country like Libya, I mean, that's, that takes off one big rationale for us maintaining <laughs> nuclear weapons. However, the political debate in Europe and in NATO would have been extraordinarily different, obviously. And the way the, the existence of that nuclear capability, even a small one, even a sim symbolic one, would have had a huge impact on the public opinion debate and parliamentary debate well, in those countries which have a parliament, which is not really the case for mine, but, <laughs> but, but it, it, it would have had a huge impact like that. My bottom line is to say, I mean, don't assume that a small symbolic <coughs> nuclear capability in Libya would necessarily have deterred the British and the French from uh, con uh, considering intervention. Sorry, Libya. <coughs> to interrupt, but what about the prospect of Gaddafi actually using tactical weapons if he had any against his own people? Well, you're going very far, Hassan. Um, I don't that's, believe. That's no, I mean this is this is. I mean chemicals, yes. Nukes, I think. Well, <coughs> we would need to have another two-hour conversation. But right. chemicals, <coughs> that that was possible. Notice, he had, he may still have had a few chemicals which were usable under certain conditions. But but anyway. Um, let me add just uh, about those who have failed to prevent further proliferation in our scenario. That includes Iran. Every country who became which became nuclear has sought to close the door of the bound behind it. You would have to expect that Iran does the same, but Iran has failed too. Iran, in our scenario, Iran has failed to prevent yes. further proliferation. Now, whether that leads to a devaluation of the nuclear currency uh, is an interesting question. At which point does it become does the marginal <laughs> value of getting nuclear weapons become so? Uh, and this will be a great article for uh, one of you to write some in 2032 in the American Political Science Review, you know, the economics of further proliferation in the PNME. You know, you know, it's a serious question. I mean, uh, beyond 15 countries or so, I mean, there, there may come a point where the value of having nukes may, may be different. I mean, either you do want to have them because everybody has them, has them, or, oh, you're just another nuclear country. I, I don't know what, what I don't know what. Yeah, nuclear countries are a dime a dozen, as we would say. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Exa exactly. <laughs> well, again, it's just a question. Uh, final point: uh, We haven't talked much about Israel, but in a PNME, um, Israel could either be the country who would have the which would have the most important number of nuclear diets to manage, or could be in a position where it starts to reevaluate re once again its strategic relationship in the region, and we know that Israel can be very adaptive in this regard, but uh, the question about Turkey, you know, faced with a nuclear Iran, what does become now again of the Turkey-Israel relationship? It's an open question. I, I, I don't think it would be as simple as it sounds. Likewise, for the whole 
Turkey, Israel, Saudi Arabia uh, question. Sub question, because it's an endless debate, how acceptable would it be for Israel to imagine the presence of nuclear weapons on Saudi soil? Another open question. Um. I'll start off with the with the Israel question. Then I'm, the, I'm very interested in the Benghazi question. Um, I, I mean, one of the one of the interesting things about the Israel question is, let's say uh, let's say the Israelis do strike the Iranian nuclear uh, strike Iranian nuclear facilities. How does that change the calculations of different Arabs, different Arab states, different Arab actors? Uh, when uh, I might have been the ambassador who mentioned that maybe Qatar looks to the U.S. for looks to the U.S. for protection, seeks to put itself under a, a more explicit articulation of American protection and American nuclear umbrella. Well, look if the Americans don't do anything to, pr to protect their vital interest in the Persian Gulf, and yet the Israelis do. Maybe that changes the calculation of some Arab actors. Um, I don't know exactly how that's how that's expressed, how much of that is overt, or how much of it is under the table. But I think that's, that's one thing to think about. Um, the Benghazi question, I think, is, is fascinating because we're, when we're talking about the Middle East, we're so used to the idea of Israel being targeted by Iran, uh, or Iran targeting, or rather Israel targeting Iranian nuclear facilities. Well, what are the targets that different people choose in a polynuclear Middle East? Why would Gaddafi, if he attacked Benghazi, does he have to actually attack the city? Or does he have to kill people? Or can he just get everyone back in line by attacking somewhere near Benghazi and everyone gets the message that the next nuclear attack will be closer to them? The ambassador was also speaking about how close all these different countries are together, but the cities are very much spread out. There's a lot of desert in the region. Um, so what do people have to target? What do the targets look like? And it comes back to your question, Halal, about mutually assured terrorism. How does it, how does it escalate? Well, again, uh, the question would be at what point are populations targeted? Uh, or what kinds, of, what kinds of populations? I mean, maybe in different ways. You know, Saddam, Saddam gassed the Kurds. Would someone like Saddam uh, do the same? Th you, you do the same thing with a nuclear weapon? Yeah, I think that's possible. But I think it's also important to to think about the different the different targets. I mean, American targeting during the Cold War was different than Soviet targeting. What do the different actors in the Middle East target? What do they look at? Uh, I was telling Hassan that the thought of Gaddafi nuking Benghazi sounds like a Sacha Baron Cohen movie to me. <laughs> Um, I'm not saying it could not happen. And I was agreeing. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, since the issue of uh, uh, how countries would, would how, how this proliferation cascade might develop is, is certainly very much in front of us. I mean, it's worth noting. I mean, I don't know which way this cuts. There are lots of variables here. But if the catalyst for this process is an Iran that seeks to use nuclear weapons in a sense to provide itself a sort of uh, general war safe haven, a re regime immunity in a sense, as a protective shield from behind which, as we heard from our first panel, the idea is to conduct lower level uh, aggression to change the status quo. Uh, not so much using nukes directly, you're not going to go out, go out and strike someone with them, but using them to, to set the conditions in which you will pursue your own sort of dreams of regional hegemony and relying upon that shield to keep others from really fundamentally reacting, uh, setting a ceiling on what they can do in response to you. Um, then, you know, it's an open question from that very purely sort of game theoretical perspective, how useful nuclear weapons are as a counter to that. If I'm Bahrain or the Saudis, do, do nuclear weapons on those terms and those terms alone actually allow me to meet that Iranian concern? Are they useful um, to, to keep Iran from sponsoring terrorism? Is it creditable to threaten, you know, Tehran and, uh, and Qom in response to, you know, the odd non-state provocation inside my country? Um, so from those, from that perspective, the driver is not as powerful as that. But you, as, you, as we've also been talking about, there are a lot of other issues in play here. First of all, uh, it's not a given that that other countries in the region wouldn't want themselves to set a ceiling on what Iran can do to them. I mean, this issue of a protective shield is, uh, you know, works both ways. And perhaps there is concern, especially by smaller and weaker neighbors, about the potential of. Uh, for, for general war conventional attack from an aggressive Iran that does feel immunized against collective response against a smaller neighbor. Uh, 
Um, you know, and so one might want to, you know, I might want nukes in confronting an Iran so that to, to, to limit the problem set that I have to worry about. Okay, well, at least I can be sure that they're not going to invade me conventionally. Um, I might want that kind of a shield from behind which to undertake, frankly, my own counter, uh, you know, mutually assured terrorism. You know, well, let's, you know, game on. Let's, let's see what happens here. Um, I would want some immunity from behind which to do those things myself. Um, we've heard talk of nuclear weapons as, you know, kind of civilizational equalizers, if you will, as, uh, you know, the, the status value of these things. You know, how could I, as a, uh, as an Arab or a Turk, um, countenance the Persians having this thing and not I? Surely, you know, my culture deserves to be represented in this game as well. Um, so all these factors are, you know, will provide drivers. But it's worth thinking a little bit about precisely what would be going through the minds of why these tools and how these tools would be necessary to players. I think, on balance, the pressure would still very much be towards a cascade, but it's not a completely straightforward calculation. And when we talk about the NPT you know, committing suicide in 2015, um, that's a nice shorthand, but it's also useful to think about how that would occur, um, in the sense that I imagine that you know, an Iranian bomb and a, you know, an Egyptian bomb or whatever, you know, there wouldn't, there wouldn't, you wouldn't go to the review conference and decide, oh, I guess it's over. We, you know, this obviously doesn't work. Let's just tear it up and walk away. You can imagine this being a very complicated process of decay and degradation as well. But the point I, I want to make about that is that we should not assume that all players in, uh, who presently have a strong principled commitment to non-proliferation will necessarily retain that commitment, even in the outside world, um, in the event of a increasingly polynuclearized Middle East, or frankly any other uh, region of the world. I mean, clearly there are enormous costs to international peace and security of, of ongoing proliferation, um, but it's not a blank slate either, and I think what policymakers at the time, at some hypothetical point in the future, would need to be evaluating is how that stacks up against the available alternatives. And at some point, if the regime finds itself unable to prevent proliferation to regimes that are unabashedly in favor of revising status quo around the world, um, you run the risk of being confronted not with an alternative between, gee, a nicely non-proliferated world in which everyone gets along with each other, uh, but a world in which it is proliferated and terribly dangerous compared to a world which is also proliferated, but in which it is only sort of the rogue regimes who get the new tools, right? And so you end up creating, to some extent, an incentive structure that may lead others in the outside world, for instance, to frankly lose some of their enthusiasm for non-proliferation. Um, how does someone in Washington, 25 years from now, in good conscience, tell a Kuwaiti that, you know, gosh, I'm really sorry that you're surrounded by all these aggressive nuclear-armed neighbors who are pushing you around and uh, your regional, you know, and, and conventional powers as well who are you know, far outmatch your capabilities. But, you know, I'm such a principled supporter of non-proliferation that I'm going to insist that you essentially surrender yourself to them. At some point, the calculation does start to shift, at least to a degree, and you may see an erosion even of the principled basis for non-proliferation in certain contexts around the world. And that is also a very troubling dynamic, but that gives you a window into how the system can decay. It's not just this, oh, it's done, tear it up. But you may actually see the, 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 the conceptual shift uh, of non-proliferation as a value and for the promotion of international peace and security, not being quite as uncomplicated as we perhaps have long assumed it to be. Let me just raise, um, <coughs> just to tease out some of the ideas that people have been talking about. I'd like to pe focus people on Volkswagen buses as delivery vehicles as opposed to missiles. Um, so if a confrontation is going on between Iran and Iran, and a ground burst occurs of a nuclear weapon which takes out, say, um, I'm sorry, maybe make it uh, any of these three, any of the countries, including Saudi Arabia, takes out their oil field. The value of everybody else's oil in the world is just gone considerably. The immediate suspicion, I suppose, is that the person who did this was the leader of the country that the visible confrontations was like, oh, this is the Sergio Leone strategic doctrine. That <laughs> um, how, does, how do people respond? Um, do you, on the, on the assumption that it was Iran nuclear, you know, take out, and, and then the morality of this issue and the sensitivity to the morality of the issue, we are swapping Iran has to choose, do I let uh, Egypt become nuclear, do I let another country become nuclear, knowing that what I'm putting at risk is both my own population um, and I'm going to be threatening the Saudi population, uh, the non-Shia portion of the Saudi population. So there's a combination of the risk of anonymous warfare, as they used to call it in the jargon, um, and also the, whether the calculations on the morality of offense and defense 
are going to be the same. Secondly, the question of whether, which I think uh, was alluded to earlier, uh, whether nuclear weapons make the world safe for medieval warfare. That is to say, you can do everything but take the other guy's capital. This is in the old days when you could, you could you know, run in, havoc, rape, pillage, other fun sports. Um, but the one thing you couldn't easily do is take their capital because of the So if there are nuclear warfare, and as Chris says, you feel safe that you're, uh, you have a nuclear shield, so you feel safe they won't actually push you to the extreme, uh, does it not, in some sense, um, lower the threshold for conventional warfare? Because the, uh, you believe, you believe, you can easily miscalculate, but you believe that the, uh, the bottom line, the, the, the cost to you can be contained. A world not of uh, the Ardennes, that would be perhaps too much, but of uh, multiple and incessant cargo. Probably. Oh, incessant cargo. Cargo. Yeah. yeah. I can. can I take a shot at sure. it? Look, in that hypothetical PNME, I would not rule out the possibility of some kind of, I would hate to call it the gentleman's agreement, but as a general rule, a tradition of non-use of nuclear weapons on your oil and gas installations. Uh, because once someone try, breaks that taboo, then it's broken for everyone. And even between deadly adversaries, uh, gentlemen's agreements, well, I won't, I'll stop calling them gentlemen's agreements, but this kind of unspoken or implicit taboos and sometimes explicit taboos can exist. Look, look at the non-use of chemical weapons in World War II. Uh, there are all sorts of theories and explanations, but there was a de facto taboo. Okay. Um, now, I think the answer to your questions would basically depend on whether this is the first use ever of a, of a nuclear weapon since Nagasaki, or whether there have been other uses uh, in between. Because if it's the first use of a nuclear weapon, then it's difficult not to expect the external major powers not to intervene. If it has not, if there have been other uses, then all bets are well. I'm not, I mean, I'm not in a position to answer this technically, but it's not a completely <coughs> obvious to me that in fact using nuclear weaponry against an oil field is necessarily a particularly useful you know, form of nuclear attack. That's or, a correct. refinery, maybe, yes. You can certainly do a number on, a, on an installation. Um, you can do a number on cities, of course, and that sort of thing. But uh, I, I, wonder, I wonder whether the actual assets themselves, in fact, would be jeopardized in this context. Maybe it wouldn't, which may change the calculation. Yeah. Um, one other question I'd like to raise um, is, is this, and it it's, pertains to why I raised the, the Turkey question. And I, I take Bruno's point that uh, it, Turkey is in this very peculiar situation, uh, already in a sense being a nuclear force for the reasons that you mentioned. But it, it has to do with uh, where we started, which was the Iranian regime. And, um, and there's this ongoing question that's been, uh, it's been put a number of times uh, by many people. Uh, the one who repeats it most often without uh, deriving any satisfaction from it, I think, is Kissinger, who says Iran has to decide between being a state or being a movement. And my point in raising the question of Turkey or any of these other uh, countries is that they, too, uh, in response to that, face something of the same issue with all the forces that are going on in, in the region. Is in the case of Turkey, is Turkey a, will Turkey decide to be a state? In which case, it's a state that's part of NATO. Um, uh, <clears throat> it approaches things as a state, as a part of NATO, or does it see itself in the future or already as somehow the leader of the Sunni part of the region uh, and in competition? And that creates different kinds of, I think, ambitions and calculations. And the same thing would might be true for other states in the region, insofar as that their internal politics creates that kind of uh, those kinds of choices. Until very recently, Egypt was Egypt uh, and had been Egypt for a long time. Uh, 
a state without particular regional ambitions. Now, uh, that could change depending on the character of the regime after, after wherever the revolution winds up. And the same, I think, was argued on behalf of Saudi Arabia late, uh, that Saudi Arabia might uh, is always somewhere between being a regime, a state, and a family, and the leader of a worldwide movement. But it might also have these kinds of choices to make. And I, I guess, my question is um, how that might be affected within a nuclear environment does on the one hand does it make it um, the use of or the the interest in having nuclear weapons more important on the other hand does the existence of a what are we calling an M MNPE um, uh, uh, does that actually have a, a reciprocal effect on the politics of countries does it encourage them or discourage them from being, uh, when they're facing these kinds of choices, does it, do they want to be um, a nation state with particular national interests or do they want to be sort of an ideological uh, state? Um, I think that one of the things that happened during the Arab Spring was I think the limits of uh, Turkish soft power in the region were shown to be extremely limited. There was a lot of Turkish triumphalism and the idea that there would be, there was a Turkish model and Erdogan was the leader of the Sunnis. I think this was shown to be extremely limited. So I think that that calculation, I suspect that the calculation for the Turks would have to come at this point as a nation state, not as a leader of the Sunnis. I don't know how aware they are of it, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's, I think the Arabs recognize this now, especially regarding Syria. The other, the other point I'd, I'd make is that um, in the first panel, um, Ali and, and Dave both spoke about the militarization of, um, or how the nuclear program in Iran would help the militarization of the regime. And I think that right now, if you're Erdogan or if you're the AK party, you are at loggerheads with much of the military establishment. And if there's anything analogous that would happen there, the idea of empowering the military, I think is something that they would, would very much want to avoid at this yeah. point. Well, let me toss out a question, though, because I think it was touched on by Dave Warmfield's comments uh, a bit earlier. Um, to some extent, Iran is itself a wild card here. To the <coughs> degree that Iran engages itself more explicitly after acquiring nuclear weaponry and being empowered thereby, um, as a self-conscious leader of, uh, well, of reclaimed leadership of, of world Shiism as a movement, and then you know, to make a play, in a sense, for Islam as a whole, to the extent that that happens, um, it, it's, that can elicit counter-dynamics, in a sense. I mean, if, if I am in, uh, in Cairo, uh, or in Ankara, or, or somewhere else, the degree to which I think of myself as a nation state versus a movement may be conditioned by the degree to which others are putting in play leadership of collective entities of which I am either excluded or a part. And you can draw from others competitive dynamics as a movement by asserting them yourself in ways that wouldn't necessarily come naturally under present circumstances, but that can be elicited in perhaps problematic ways that, that I think need to be considered as we look at the landscape of possibility. I wanted to, oh, if, if I may just make you a can make comment. Turkey into that kind of a movement leader if you really push it in certain ways. Uh, 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 my, my short answer is that actually this contradiction between do you want to be a state, do you want to be a movement, uh, just takes a long time to resolve because the, those who would rather be the movement want to use the state for the movement. And those who would rather be the state want to use the movement to consolidate the state. And so it's it, it, it's a... Uh, uh, without sort of, uh, it's it, 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 yeah, and it's a, and it's a, and it's a, it's 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 the kind of Stalin versus Trotsky kind of argument, uh, which takes place everywhere, uh, and I think Iran has it, and once the Muslim Brotherhood has real power anywhere, um, they will have it, uh, and we see that. Uh, but but I think institutions of state which is the point that Ali had brought in this morning, uh, they have a more significant sort of definitional role in this. Uh, so will the Iranian military get consolidated and use both the state and the movement 
for corporate gains uh, and 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 then how would others feel for example in turkey uh, surely erdogan doesn't want the military uh, to gain but there may be other places i can see field marshal tantawi actually thinking very much about you know what uh, i am an army i had an army without a movement i had a professional army maybe at some point i need to embrace an army a movement to be able to get legitimacy so all those consequences are the political consequences of the militarization of iran proceeding from the nuclearization of iran um i wanted to uh, ask the um, our panelists from the first uh, panel uh, if they wanted to uh, raise a question or offer a comment about david uh One scenario that hasn't been raised is the potential for the Bob Eucher scenario where you have, you know, four or five nuclear weapon states. Uh, rather than dyadic relationships, but the use of a third party to trigger a conflict between others and the potential for that because the Middle East has a very rich history of third parties trying to trigger wars between party 1 and party 2 and uh, in the 67 war for example early on in 66 a precursor to that was an attempt by Syria to send terrorists through the West Bank to mi- conduct a major attack to provoke a war between Israel and Jordan which then would help Syria in its ambitions in Jordan or the Arab Republic and its uh, ambitions in Jordan I could imagine a scenario like that as well and how would that be uh, I mean obviously it adds to the in- instability even further um I think I uh, I think we're out of time um <coughs> I want to say that um uh we're now back to June 21st 2012 Um, I think on the basis of uh, today's conversation, um, we can all uh, at least hope, uh, maybe even pray that um, several of these uh, cir- circumstances do not uh, happen. Uh, but um, uh, I think we can also say that our panel uh, did a very great service in uh, imagining what these circumstances look like. what kinds of things have to be considered what kinds of things should actually be seriously considered uh, today June 21st 2012 and i want to thank uh them for all the really splendid uh uh comments and and really great thoughtfulness that was exercised about these subjects Good to see you. What's fun? Great. Good job. And you got a new backroom. Sorry.